Good morning, church. Welcome. Uh, if you're new here, my name is Stephen Overt. I'm the youth director. Uh, perhaps you envision someone younger being the youth director. Uh, my parents are glad that, that uh, I get to do that job. So um, we're going to take a break from the book of James. As you heard earlier, uh, Pastor Josh is out of town with the motorcycle club uh, doing some ministry uh, on a national rally. And so pray for him this morning, pray for their witness, their testimony to those that they run into, pray that their travels are safe, uh, that the Lord brings them back home to us to continue on. Uh, But most importantly, pray for God's will to be done. Uh, We know that that's his heartbeat for this time. So Um, with that being said, we have a great opportunity to take our time this morning to look at something that's really a heartbeat for us here at Disciples Church when it comes to family ministry, how we raise our kids. Um, It's our desire to partner with parents as you raise your children for God's glory. Now, as a quick disclaimer, the scriptures that we're going to be digging into this morning are for our youth, they're for our parents, our grandparents, So I don't want you to hear me say the focus is on parents and raising children and go, okay, I can check out, I'm done, especially you. (laughs) Um, (laughs) One key thing to remember is that as we look at God's commands upon parents to raise up their children, is that even in the simplest form, we can apply that same understanding to how we disciple others. And as Christ's great commission commandment for us to go and disciple the nations is is a reality for everyone, then surely this morning, in the Word, in our time together, you'll have some stuff to take away with you. So, with that, let's pray, and then I'll dive in. Father, thank you for our time together this morning. To gather with the saints, to sing, pray, worship, take communion. I'm so thankful for our blood-bought family to come together weekly and celebrate you. I'm thankful for our blood-bought family to walk with daily through the ups and downs, being encouraged, rebuked, and loved. I pray that our time in the Word this morning would be edifying and fruitful, but above all things, as always, we pray, Lord, that you would be glorified in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin our look at the scriptures this morning with an example of what happens when God's people don't take seriously his call on them to raise their children according to his truths. Joshua chapter 2, verses 10 through 11. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And all, sorry, and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served the Baals. This is such a sobering passage of Scripture. When a generation arises and they do not know the Lord, what has essentially happened? Well, the generation prior has failed to train them up or disciple them. When this happens, it never goes well for the next generation. If you've spent much time in the Old Testament, you'll see this theme repeat over and over again. You see, when we fail to, as the last part of Ephesians 6, 4 says, bring them, our children, up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, then we will reap the consequence of failing the next generation. The very clear consequence here in our Joshua passage is that they will grow up being wise in their own eyes, going about life according to their own way, even unto worshiping false gods. You see, mankind has been created for worship. We are innately drawn to worship something, and if we are not properly trained, we will, in our sin, worship things that will lead to destruction. Church, this is a problem that we face today. 
We have had a well-intentioned generation doing what they thought best for their families, but it was not in line with God's word. And so we end up with a generation who has been discipled more by the world around them and the world's ideologies than by parents who were called to raise them up in the Lord's truths. Now, I know I'm coming out of the gate a little hot, and I want to be clear. I don't think it has been an intentional desire of the parents of a lost generation to fail in this area. In fact, I'd say this goes back a few generations. You see, when we fail to disciple people unto them discipling people, then you are left with generational leaders doing what they think is best, but never having been trained or taught how to do what God has said is best. And this does not come without bumps and bruises. When we talk about raising up a generation, raising our children, it is hard work. The parents in the room are, amen, this, thank you. But children are a blessing from God. In fact, it's a blessing that we at Disciples Church truly long to join you in. So with that, let me share with you my desire for the rest of our time this morning, and we'll jump in. Uh, I have three main points that we're going to look at. First, I want us to look at the foundation of biblical parenting. Second, I want us to look at the phases of biblical parenting. And third, I want us to see our desperate dependency upon God for biblical parenting. So, So again, first, the foundation of biblical parenting. Second, the the phases of biblical parenting. And third, our our desperate dependency upon God for biblical parenting. Open up your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 6. We are going to spend some time there and to come back there a little bit later so you can kind of keep your finger in there as we go. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. The foundation of biblical parenting Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. This passage is known as the Shema. The Hebrew word Shema means to hear. The passage literally starts with the word Shema. Shema, O Israel, hear, O Israel. Now, if you've spent much time in other languages, you know that translations can be complicated. Many times we use a word that that has more than one meaning, or it has a deeper meaning than the typical surface-level reading of the word. And that's exactly what we have here in the word Shema. This word means much more than to just hear, as in let sound waves come into your ear. It actually carries with it the definition and command to listen and obey. It's not just hear, but it's do what you're hearing. The Hebrew word Shema has kind of two sides to the same coin. On one side, it's listen, hear. On the other side, it's obey, follow through with what you've heard. In fact, in ancient Hebrew, there was no other word for obey. It was Shema. When the people of God did not obey God's commands, the prophets in their rebuke would say they had ears, but they did not shema. Now, of course, the prophets didn't mean that they literally had a deafness. They couldn't hear what was being said. No, they knew the commands. They knew them very well. But they did not do them. They did not obey them. Therefore, they did not shema. This passage was such a big deal that for thousands of years, it was the practice of the, of the Jewish people to say this as a prayer in the morning and in the evening. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. What an amazing practice this would be to begin and end your day with this sweet command of the Lord to rightly remember who he is and who we are and what place he needs to have in our life. As we continue... I want to take note that when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment, he quoted the Shema, Matthew 22, verse 37. 
And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. So the Shema, the the call to listen and obey the command of the living God with all your heart, soul, and mind was well known and continued to be well known throughout the history of God's people. Now you might be saying, I thought we were focusing on on parents and kids this morning, and I'm going to get to that in a second, but we've got to do a few things prior to that. First, if God is not your Lord, if you do not love him with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, then the rest of what we're going to dive into this morning won't make much sense to you. You will not be able to submit to God's command to raise your children in him, nor would you truly desire to do so. God's word is very clear. Prior to submission and obedience must come repentance and faith. In fact, what God says you need the most is to hear the gospel. So what is the gospel? That's exactly the catechism question that my daughter has been memorizing for the last two weeks in preparations for our new foundations program that starts on Wednesday. That's what Marilyn was referring to this morning. So I'm going to ask the question, what is the gospel? And then I'm going to read the answer. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news of the grace and power of God to redeem undeserving sinners to eternal life through Jesus' perfect, sinless life, substitutional, sacrificial death, and victorious resurrection from the grave. These sinners are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus alone. From the eternal wrath they deserved, and they are reconciled into an eternally secure relationship with God. Church, no one is innocent. We've adopted this cultural idea that that person has a good heart. That's not what the Word of God says. We have all failed to rightly acknowledge the Creator of all things in our hearts and in our actions, and this sin is what separates us from a perfect, holy, righteous God. You do not need to remain an enemy of God this morning. You can repent of your sin and turn to him, trusting and believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. Christ did what you and I could not do. He took the place of wretched sinners under God's wrath, the wrath we deserved, so that we could have forgiveness in him. There's a great post on Facebook, and if you know me well, I hardly ever say that. And it said that, Jesus saw the best in me, and then he died to forgive me for it. The scriptures are clear. Even our greatest deeds are as filthy rags. We are desperate for a Savior. And God, at great cost, graciously provided one. If you have not repented of sin and trusted in Christ alone for salvation, then I implore you that you would spend your time this morning considering these truths. The rest of what I have to say is not going to matter much to you. Consider where you are in your sin and consider the great Savior, Jesus Christ, and repent and believe. Secondly, Christian parents, I aim to lovingly encourage you here to take inventory of your hearts. Ask yourself if this Shema is your heartbeat. Do you love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might? If you're struggling here, then cry out to God. Ask him for help. No matter how long you have lived as a redeemed sinner, you and I and all true believers can always be growing and sanctified in this area. Ask God to make this your earnest desire. Plead with God to turn your heart completely unto him. You see, I would do you guys a great injustice today if I did not point out 
that this must, it must be the foundation for the rest of what we're going to dig into this morning. So with that foundation laid, let's look at the larger context of our Deuteronomy passage. We're going to read verses 4 through 9 of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. God's command to his people is that we would love him above all things, that we would hear and keep his commandments, and that we would teach them diligently to our children. Now, in case you were wondering how diligent, like what is diligently? When you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. So basically, if you and your children are conscience, con- conscious, I always mess that word up. If you're not sleeping and dreaming of something, then, then these words must be on your lips. You must be pouring out God's truths to your children. It's happening at rest, at play, upon wakening, and upon going to bed. That is diligent. So there are some real practical takeaways from this part of Scripture that we're going to unpack throughout the rest of our morning as we go along. But I wanted to start here. Parents, you have to see that this cannot be the job of someone else. A youth leader or a children's leader, a church elder, they're not with your kids all throughout your day. We're not there when they wake up, when they go to sleep, unless you're my wife and then I'm there with my kids when they wake up and go to sleep. Um, We have got to see how clearly God wants us to know that he has handed this role to you, the parents. And I really believe that this is where previous generations who have either felt unequipped or in sin were just lazy, and they ended up leaning on others to do this work for them. The unfortunate side effect of that is a generation who does not know God, as we discussed in my introduction. Please grasp the weight of this. God's first and greatest command is to love him with all your being. And this is followed with the command to teach your children all that he has commanded us as diligently as possible. Do you take hold of every opportunity to point your child back to Christ? Do you look intentionally for ways to preach the great gospel to your children? Do you celebrate and make known God's good law? Do you talk about your Lord so faithfully that it's not like an odd or uncomfortable situation when you bring up what God has commanded? This is how we are to raise our children, and it's a a natural outpouring of a heart that loves God above all other things. Youth, do you hear God's command upon your parents? Do you get bored when your parents press God's word into your life? Stop. Don't make this a burden for your parents. God has commanded them to do it, and if they love the Lord, they will obey him. If they love you, they will trust that he knows what's best for you, and they will obey him. Don't fight them in this area. Remember, If you fight your parents in this area, you will be fighting God, and that does not go well. Now, for those in between being a child and a parent, are you preparing for what your future might hold? 
Do you know what God has commanded so that if he blesses you by birth or adoption or, or foster care with children of your own, are you equipped, are you ready to rightly handle this command and apply it to your life? Better yet, perhaps God's call is that you will never be a parent personally. Perhaps God has given you the gift, and to be clear, the Bible calls it a gift of singleness. How are you being a parent to the parentless in that season? Do you find ways to be a part of discipling the next generation? Are you taking advantage of this season and being discipled yourself so that if God perhaps allows you to have children one day, you're prepared? You see, there really isn't a season of life where this text cannot apply to you. It simply applies in different ways. I pray that you see the value in obeying this command. Church, let us not be a generation who leaves the next one empty and chasing after fake gods. The world we live in has billions of idols to offer your children. They will be, and I guarantee are already bombarded with fake gods and worthless idols to worship and invest their lives in. Parents, if we do not disciple our children in the Lord, they will be discipled by the world around them. And in 15 years of youth ministry, I can assure you that this is happening. But God has given us the answer. He has commanded us to constantly be pouring into our children's hearts the truths about him. And I hope you see how important it is that this be our foundation, that everything we do in parenting will be done in a greater grace and love if it is overflowing from our totally devoted love to our Lord and Savior. So let's move on to our second point this morning, the phases of biblical parenting. What do we mean when we speak of the phases of raising our children? Um, if any of you have ever listened to Pastor Vody Bauckham, this will sound familiar to you as we've really gleaned a lot from his teaching on this subject. And we've also covered this in some detail during the foundations meetings for parents. So uh, if you were part of that the last two Sundays, you've definitely heard about uh, this idea of, of parenting phases. And let me give you a brief summary of what we call the three phases of parenting. And then we're going to dive into the biblical text to see these truths in God's word. And this is how we've broken down the phases. Phase one is the give me your attention and obedience phase. This is where we, as parents, must teach our children that we are the God-given authority in their life. We have been commanded by God to instruct and discipline our children, and we help them see that they would do well to honor and obey us in this role. This phase begins at birth, and it is the primary focus from the age of when your, when your child is born until they're really able to communicate well. Um, obviously, uh, obedience and discipline continue all throughout their life. Uh, parents of teenagers are shaking their head. Um, but that's when we turn to phase two. Phase two is the give me your mind for the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Parents, during this phase, we teach our children what to believe and why to believe it according to God's holy word. This is where using the catechism uh, is a great practice for teaching biblical truths and helping your children memorize them. The foundations that we lay during this time last for a lifetime. And this is a, a primary focus from the age of communication through puberty. And that's when we turn to phase three, the give me your hand. We move from a primarily instructional type of setting to increasingly showing our children how to live out what we've taught them to believe. This is where we take their hand and we show them how to apply all the truths that we've taught to their everyday life. And let me point out something very important. While each of these phases have a, a heightened focus in certain age ranges, you really do all of these to some degree in each phase of a child's life. Uh, if you think they aren't taking your hand and watching what you're doing, wait until you mess up and your four-year-old will proudly tell you, hey, I noticed that, right? <laughs> Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6 reads, Train up a child 
in the way that he should go, even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, something that is helpful to remember when we are looking at wisdom literature is that it's not the same as God promising to do something. Many people have felt a a great heartache, I'd even say a, a sense of betrayal, when they've diligently raised their child up in the Lord, and then they've watched their child turn away from that same Lord that they raised them up in when they're older. This passage is not a promise that if you raise your children in the Lord, they will most definitely be saved. That's not what it's saying. In fact, more specifically, this passage is saying that whatever way you raise your child, whether disciplined or undisciplined, whether to respect others or not, whether to work hard or be lazy, that way that you teach your children will likely be the way they remain as they grow old. You see, this passage in Proverbs is more of a warning to parents that you are training into your children lifelong habits and thoughts. So be aware of this as you raise them. We as Christians should see the wisdom of raising our children as God commanded, because wisdom says they are likely to take on the life that we train them in. Open up to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This passage begins with a command to children. Youth, pay attention. Obey your parents, in the Lord. For this is right. What what Paul is about to unpack is that God, who is the giver of all truth, commands children to obey parents for their own good. Parents who have had rebellious children can attest to the fact that in a very practical way, it goes bad for children who don't obey their God-given authority. When my four-year-old really wants to run out in the street to grab a toy that rolled out of the front yard, and I can see traffic coming, and I go, stop. If she doesn't obey, it doesn't go well for her. Really, there's something far greater at stake here. If my daughters cannot learn to lovingly obey me, their earthly father, how much more difficult will it be for them to lovingly obey the Heavenly Father? You see, in God's economy, obedience and love go hand in hand. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If I cannot teach my children to obey their earthly father, then they are in a much graver danger of never learning to love and obey God. And this leads to eternal death, far greater than if my child gets hit in the street by a car. Church, I hope you see the weight of this. Children, youth, God has called you to honor your mother and father through obedience. And listen, as the Apostle Paul highlights, God graciously gives you a promise. In fact, it was the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you, that your life may be long in the land. Parents, you are inadvertently here commanded to train your children to obey in the Lord. If they must obey, then you must be disciplining them, teaching them, and instructing them to obey, right? An undisciplined child is not a loved child. It is a child who has been trained to think that the world revolves around them And they are set up for disaster if this is not corrected. My wife and daughters have been studying through Proverbs. And this past week, Aaron, uh, my wife, if you don't know who that is, called me on Tuesday to tell me about their morning. They just so happened to read through Proverbs chapter 13, 
verse 24, and they did it in the NIV, so I'm going to read it from NIV. Proverbs 13, 24. Whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their child is careful to discipline them. So my nine-year-old, Azaria, reads this, is thinking about it, and she looks at my wife and she said, I didn't know this. You have to discipline me if you love me. And she says, thank you, Mom, for loving me. Erin was practically in tears when she called. And I just thought, how amazing, how timely is God's word in our lives? God has declared, if you love your children, you will discipline them. It's clear between the Ephesians passage that we read and this Proverbs passage that we are to teach obedience. We are to instruct our children in the Lord. And again, we see the attention and obedience work really lay the foundation in the first phase of your child's life. That They lay a foundation that bleeds into that second phase where teaching and instruction becomes the main focus. Now, there's also a warning in this passage, and I want to make sure to draw out that warning here before we move on. The passage said, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Colossians says it like this, Colossians chapter 3, verse 20, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. You see, there is a way in which you may raise your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord that is good and right. And then fathers, there is a way that we may do it that will provoke or discourage them. Fathers, it seems that there may be a particular bent in the male leadership to provoke a child to anger and discouragement. Perhaps this is because of our natural tendency to be less nurturing. Fathers can tend to be brasher in our approach to our children. Now, as a quick litmus test, ask yourselves, would you allow another man to speak to or provoke your children like you do? If your answer is no, then you're probably committing the sin and you need to repent of it. Make sure to heed this warning, fathers. It really does seem to be given to us specifically as it shows up in Scripture multiple times addressing the dads. So with phase one's focus of teaching our children to give us their attention and to obey us as God has called them to, how do we practically play out phase two, the instructing of our children? Well, one of the key ways that we do this is through catechism training. A catechism is a series of questions and answers that we use to to train our children and everybody else to learn and remember deep doctrinal foundational truths about God so that they set these truths in their mind and they remain there. We use our Word of Truth catechism that Marilyn mentioned earlier in our uh, sermon. Sorry, I used it in the sermon earlier And we use it in our midweek study so that the adults and the children and the youth are all on the same page. If you were to ask one of my daughters, who is God? That's question one in our catechism. They'll both be able to answer you. God is the almighty creator, sustainer, and ruler of all things. He is perfect and the standard by which all things are measured. This foundational truth is something that they repeat often, and they really enjoy being able to show others that they've memorized it. One way we long to partner with you, the parents, is by providing programs like our foundation classes that begin this week. The class uses this catechism training as its foundation. It uses the scripture references for each question so that your, your children can memorize these doctrinal truths and they know where to find those truths in God's word. Imagine a generation that has set to memory foundational doctrinal truths and the scripture that undergirds it. 
This is a generation that will, be, will not be ignorant of who God is. And this season is where we help our children to memorize these things. This practice is something we'll be encouraging in our adults and our youth as well. Uh, in fact, beginning this week, we're going to dive into all of this. So, so if you're curious what midweek is, if you haven't attended that before, uh, I'd encourage you to look into that. Let us know that you're interested in coming, and we'll, we'll get a hold of you. Or grab a leader, elder afterwards, and talk to them. Um, we see that these passages clearly teach us to train our children in the way that we have outlined in the phases that we've talked about. But what about the walk with me phase? I'm going to read to you Jesus' final command to us prior to his ascension. And I want you to consider how similar it is to the Deuteronomy passage that we read in our first point. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7. And these words that I commanded you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. I want to give you some very practical steps. My first practical step is this. Are are you growing in the Lord? Are you regularly studying his word? Are you regularly attending church? Are you excited about getting plugged into midweek and, and the teaching of God's truths? Do you plan to search out more mature believers and, and ask them to help you grow in your faith? If you do not know what God has commanded and revealed to us through his word, how are you working to correct that? Are you being discipled more intentionally? Is there a more mature believer in your life who you are seeking out to ask for rebuke, for training, for teaching, so that you may mature and be better equipped to disciple your children and and other future people as well? If these are missing, why? Why are they missing? You see, you simply cannot teach someone something you have never learned. So parents, if your parents didn't teach you how to disciple your children, are you looking to other more mature godly parents around you for wisdom, for instruction, for correction? Are you laying God's word at your feet as the authoritative rock to stand on as you raise your children? If you think back to the Shema, the walk with me phase becomes very clear. Christ commands us to make disciples, teaching them all that he has taught us. And God commands us as parents to speak of the teachings with our children constantly. Just think about the way Christ discipled his inner 12. He literally lived with them as they walked about their day, when they woke up, when they went to sleep. He was there pouring out God's truth upon them. This is really what the third phase looks like. It's a a heightened focus of taking your child's hand and in a very real way saying, shadow me. Come with me as I do my day-to-day things. See how I go grocery shopping. See how I interact with others. See how I study the word and pray. This is where we really get to take the next steps of understanding what it means to practically be a godly man or a godly woman with our child. Right around the corner from my house is a park that blocks a major intersection from a local high school. And on the corner of that park, there are two Jehovah's Witnesses who sit quite regularly with their pamphlets to hand out to students as they walk by. Every time we drive by there, I talk to my daughters about what they believe. Jehovah's Witness, if you, if you don't know, believe that there is one God, but they also believe Jesus 
is a lesser God created by God the Father. And so I asked my daughters, who is God? God is the almighty creator, sustainer, and ruler of all things. He is perfect and the standard by which all things are measured. I'll ask my daughters, how... I forget the catechism question. Shoot, I should have that memorized. Um, I'm teaching on it soon, so I'll remind you. But essentially, it's the question about the Trinity. God exists eternally as one God, three persons. And so then I'll ask them, if they believe in two gods, do they believe in the God of the Bible? My daughter will say no. Because we've taught her that truth. We've instilled that into her. And so this walk with me phase is something I'm preparing for. When I get to walk down to the corner and in love share the gospel with these Jehovah's Witnesses and teach them that the Bible says there is only one God. And when I do that with my daughter hand in hand, I'll be able to tell her, remember all the things that daddy's taught you? Remember what we need to be saved, the gospel. That's why we came down here to share with these people. They're lost. They're heading towards disaster. They believe in a false gospel. And so as a Christian, we must put action to our feet. That's what the walk with me phase looks like. This really is the phase that I enjoy the most because practically speaking as the youth director, it's where I get to spend the bulk of my time with your youth. It's also the time that I'm most familiar with and truly long to walk with you, the parents, in to show you how you can do this. It's a time where you must be intentional to show your child how a godly man or woman lives and to root your actions in Scripture. You do this so that your child can take a concrete life lesson and apply it to an abstract or maybe concrete teaching in God's Word. You see, when this is done well, you really begin to see some amazing fruit and growth in your child's life. Walking through these different phases is one of the heartbeats of our church. The leaders in the different age groups are looking forward to getting time with you, the parents, to help share how these different phases can look in a very practical way. We also long to be on the same page with you. Each of you have a child who's struggling with a different thing. Each of you have a different background. There's a different uniqueness to your child, and God's done that on purpose. And so the leaders are trying to get time with you so that we can know that well, that we can partner with you. We understand the burden it is for you to raise up the generation. And so as best we can, we long to do that with you. We do all of this out of an ultimate desire for God to be glorified and the absolute trust that we have in our Creator to know what's best for our family and our children. It's all done for his glory and through his authority and power. We are desperate for him. Which brings me to my last point this morning. Point three, our desperate dependency upon God for biblical parenting. Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. I could stop right there. We're going to go on. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stay awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. For he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. It is no accident that the psalmist wrote this psalm and paralleled the builder of a house with having children. Your family is built with the children. But the passage says very clearly, if the Lord does not build it, it will not stand. If God is not your foundation, 
If the command to love God with all your heart, mind, strength is not the fountain from which you draw to love and raise your children in the Lord, your labor will most definitely be in vain. If you cannot apply your understanding of the gospel and its implications to your child raising, you will lose your temper. You will provoke your children. You will get lazy when the days are long, and you simply won't feel like correcting your child for the thousandth time. You see, it's critical in these moments to not forget your foundation. Parents, we will only love our children properly when we love them with God as our focus. You see, if you, if you aim to obey God because you want good kids, will you continue to obey God when your kids aren't good anymore? It's unlikely. However, if you strive to obey God when raising your children because of your deep love for God, then you will be able to endure a child who is deep in their rebellion. You will press on because the prize before you is the Lord, not your child's obedience. Now, if you've been in church for any time, surely you've heard the passage in 1 John chapter 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. Christian, you would not even be able to raise your children through your love for God if he had not first loved you. This understanding is key. We have and we will continue to teach well the sovereignty of God in your salvation and life. We are desperate for God to even produce the faith in us that causes us to love him. 1 Corinthians 13 teaches that love is selfless. The only way to love another person selflessly is if your love for them is based in someone other than them or yourself. Here's what I mean. If you love me because you benefit from my relationship with you, then when you no longer benefit, when my sin gets in the way and affects it, will you continue loving me? If the answer is no, then that love is selfless. You love out of a, a receiving of something to you. But if you love me because God loved you, even while you were his enemy, then no matter how many times I fail, you'll be able to continue and press on in love towards me. You see, if you love your kids because of God's love for you, then no matter how they respond, no matter how rebellious they become, you can trust in God to build or not build the house, and you can find your rest in him. This is how you can love your kids selflessly. Church, please, don't make your children an idol. Don't teach them that the world revolves around them. I hope you see these truths more clearly and that it blesses you as you strive to honor God with the children that he has blessed you with. So, to summarize, I told you that we were going to take a look at the foundation of biblical parenting. We saw that as we looked at the Shema and the preceding verses. I said that we'd look at the phases of biblical parenting, though we did not go into a great depth of each phase. We simply don't have that kind of time. We surely saw the biblical mandate to train our kids up in discipline, in instruction, and to walk with them. And as I said, I wanted us to see our desperate dependency upon God for biblical parenting. If God does not build the house, then our labor is in vain. One final note. Uh, I know well that raising children is hard work. You go to bed tired, depending on the age of your child, you may or may not get to sleep through the night. But God has made it clear that children are a blessing and that we must steward them well for God's glory and for their joy. The older I get, the more increasingly clear it becomes to me that to live a life poured out for others is not a wasted life. Pour out your life for your children, for those around you. Strive to think more highly of others than yourself. Fight the good fight of faith and honor God with every second that he gives you. 
Pray for your children to find favor with the Lord. Pray for yourself to combat the sinfulness that will keep you from rightly working hard to raise up the next generation. Pray for your church and its leaders as we rightly try to teach and lead in these areas and and are ourselves pouring out for you, for your family, for your children. Let's run the race well, church. Let's be a generation who raises the next and gives them zero excuse to not know the Lord. Just imagine what that might look like. To raise a generation who is solidly grounded in God's word and ways would truly be game-changing. All for God's glory. Will you bow your heads and we'll close in prayer. Father, thank you for our time this morning. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have to trust in our own abilities, but that you are the builder of the house. When things go bad, as long as we are striving to obey you, we can trust that it is your desire that they not go well in that moment. Help us to see our our desperate need for you in all of these things. Help us to love our children as you loved us, to love our enemies as you've loved us, to set that stage, that tone, and that example for the families who are coming up behind us. On long nights, on exhausted days, let us find our rest in you. Let us have energy that is not of our own. And let us raise a generation, Lord, that knows you and changes this generational problem for for years and years to come. We love you, Lord. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.